You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with Anna Subri and John Stevens here in the studio in person. Nice to see you, though. Um, so let's uh, see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, Save Our Staff reads the front page of the Metro as Tesco bosses call for more protection for staff against abusive customers. The Financial Times says Russia's banks are propped up by Chinese cash after sanctions with lending quadrupling to $9.7 billion. Trick or heat is the headline on the Daily Star's front page, with a heat wave on the way fit for zombies to burn until Halloween. The Daily Mail reports on an increase in council workers who are working remotely, with a headline, Councils allow staff to work from the beach. The Guardian leads on the concrete crisis in schools. The headline, no extra cash for repairs, says Treasury. The Sun carries an exclusive from rugby star Danny Cipriani's new book. My Promise to Workers reads the front of the mirror, reporting on Sakir Starmer's tax pledge. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by the political editor at the Daily Mirror, John Stevens, and barrister and former government minister, Anna Subri. Welcome to you both. We're going to start with um, that last story in the, the papers list there, the, that of the front page of the Metro, Save Our Staff. And this is the, the Tesco boss, um, Ken Murphy, trying to protect his staff from um, verbal and physical attacks and uh, wanting to bring in the use of body cameras. John. Yeah, this is a thoroughly depressing story. Obviously, we know that shop workers were some of those people who went to work right through the pandemic. They put their lives at risk, working all hours through the day when supermarkets were a stressful place to be. Remember all the kind of queues, people getting angry because they couldn't get any loo roll and all of that malarkey. And now this story are some really shocking figures about Tesco boss saying that as many as 850 workers a day are suffering violence and abuse. And because of this, they are now going to offer all Tesco employees who work on the shop floor the option of having body-worn cameras to make them feel slightly more protected. And I think if you were one of those Tesco workers maybe working late, maybe not in those big supermarkets, but you know those smaller formats yeah. where you get all sorts of people in late <clears> at night. It can feel, I imagine, quite intimidating if you're the only person behind the till late at night that you can see why some of these people would think, yeah, I would quite like to have a camera just so I know that if anything does happen, there is a record of it. Mm. And we've been showing some um, footage, I don't know if we can uh, run that, that again, of, of the, the sort of attacks that have been taking place on um, shop staff. And it, it is terrifying. Uh, do we think that body cams might help that situation, but you see, Anna? The, the footage that you have will be from CCTV mm. and all the shops... Um, certainly all the supermarkets, whatever their size, whatever their opening hours, have CCTV. On, and they have it to, for a number of reasons, primarily to make sure that they've got evidence of people normally when they are stealing or, as this shows, um, somebody being violent and offensive towards people who are just doing their job. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how the body-worn video really is going to make any difference to the fact that there's CCTV anyway. But the, the problem is police, is a lack of policing. I mean, we could talk about the lawlessness yeah. and whether that's an increase, which is actually what the boss of Tesco's mm. says. He says the number of attacks are going up. And, you know, that's a cause of... We need to be... What, what's going on? Why is that? Um, but also, if, if we have the police in the numbers with the priorities that, you know, we should be able to set as a society, then... Yeah, th then there would be more police around, which would then, as we know, deter exactly this sort of crime mm. and make those staff feel more secure without having to wear body-worn videos. I think it was last week the boss of Waitrose was saying that they were going to start offering free teas and coffees the to the police yeah. just as a way to encourage police officers in the, into their stores because that's the only way that there's enough police officers to come into stores if you start handing out free drinks to them. Mm. I mean, I think we have to have a very grown-up, serious conversation about 
what we want our police's priorities to be. Because, I mean, as you know, I'm, I'm back working as a criminal barrister, and the sort of stories which I'm hearing from, you know, solicitors who are there in the police stations doing the... when somebody's charged or is interviewed, is that the days when... Because we haven't had less... We haven't got less burglary. We now see from this that we've actually got more mm, violent offences against yeah. people working in shops. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, what, what's being charged? What are people being arrested for? And I'm afraid the answer is it's not these sorts of offences because the police have been given other priorities. There aren't enough of them. And so we're, we're in a right old mess. And can I just say this? The other thing, which I feel very strongly about, the idea... I know, I know why he said it, but the idea that we should have a new offence to cover these attacks on people is a really bad idea. We've got all the offences that we need to cover this, and judges will increase a sentence, see it as an aggravating feature. If somebody's just going about their their job and they when they the last thing they want is some idiot being offensive and violent and disgusting to so you think that the law covers uh, these of types of offenses now and um, john i just wonder if you can uh, address the point that anna made that, that these people are particularly in the the examples that we've shown on, on our footage they're aware that they're on cctv so is body worn cameras a body worn camera is going to make any difference at all because it's the the same situation isn't it yeah i mean i get that point i just don't see there's a negative side to it i can see that you can say well the evidence would be there from cctv cameras anyway i think if it gives shop workers some sort of reassurance then it is worthwhile even though it doesn't have a massive positive yeah okay Let, let's move on to the mail the daily mail and this story about um, council workers being allowed to work remotely um from the beach from from holiday it seems to be saying anna well i'm always a bit cynical when i read any headline in the daily mail <laughs> but if you dig into it so get the figures the number jumped from 73 approvals in 2020 to 21, the year the COVID-19 pandemic was at its height, to 414 in 21-22. And then it surged to more than 700 last year as the remote working revolution took hold. I mean, they're assuming... So people apparently are increasingly, if you work in a council, working from overseas. I actually imagine a lot of people would be a bit hacked off with the idea that they are working from the beach. Because that's the implication, isn't mm -hmm. it? That they're basically skiving. Shirking and I should be able to... It says, it spells it out, from the beach is the headline. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of people be really who are working really hard in local authorities will be pretty cheesed off with that sort of headline, that they are basically skiving off. Um, but... Or are they on holiday and actually working more hours than they should be? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because they're checking their emails, they're actually not clocking off mm. and having a proper break. They're actually working, checking their emails. So it's a bit disingenuous. Having said that, I think there is still a big problem that we haven't got the balance right, because it is a question of balance, between those people where it suits them and their employer that they have that flexibility if they want to work from home. Um, but equally, I think we need to make sure we get people that really want to be back in the office or in the workplace back in there. And I think in some cases you can see the sensible reason for it. Say if you had a parent who was sick somewhere other than where you lived and you wanted to go and care yes. for them and log in to work from home, that would be quite a sensible way to be able to carry on working without taking leave, but also be able to fulfil your caring responsibilities. But I do agree with Anna here. I do think when you speak to some people who are bosses of local authorities, I think you do need flexibility. And we know that workers now expect that when they're getting recruited. That's one of the mm. things that employers are going to have to offer. But at the end of the day, you are in work to work for your employer and speaking to some people who run local authorities, they just say when you try and pull the lever to do stuff, it is just really difficult. And we all know from working in office, it is so much easier. If you're just in a room with people, you can easily communicate. You can just grab someone for a chat. You know who's busy, who's not busy. And also for younger people who've yeah. been the victim over and over again in COVID, we talk... Every time I'm on this programme, it's something about universities or exams or something where young people are being punished. If you're a young person starting out in a workplace, a lot of that, I know from when I was starting out, you just sit there and you listen to other people on the mm. phone, you just pick up how do people behave, how does kind of workplaces operate? And if you've gone through school and university, you obviously 
don't know exactly how work, things are done in a workplace. I think that is so important, just being there and learning from seeing other people who are more experienced doing their job. Yeah, there's so much more to be gained by that in-person contact, hence you coming back to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I did it for the first time last Sunday and I, I've never been in the studio. I think you have before COVID. Just once, yeah. no, recently, yeah. And it, oh, I didn't realise you'd never been in. No. Oh. And it is, it's much easier to do it from the dining room at home, but... <laughs> well, it's less fun, fun, it's less fun. But it's, it's this, you see, you mm. can't have... And, and work isn't just about work. It's also about the sociability of work, the bouncing around of ideas, but it's also about making friends, it's being sociable. Absolutely. And lovely to see you in person. <laughs> um, let's move on to The Guardian, and this is the um, school's crisis, the crumbling concrete rock. Uh, Jeremy Hunt um, saying that there'll be no extra cash for repairs from the Treasury. It should come out of the, the education budget. Um, is that a surprise, John? Well, you compare the two things. You had Jeremy Hunt out on the shows this morning say, we'll spend whatever it takes, and then you've got government sources kind of clarifying that, and it doesn't sound like they will be willing to spend whatever it takes. But it feels like this problem is something that's going to go on and on and on. It doesn't feel like it's just going to be in these hundred or so schools, they're going to get sorted, and that's the end of the problem. We had stories in the papers yesterday in the Sunday Mirror about how there could be 7,000 schools that haven't been properly checked. Yeah. We know there's problems in hospitals, the prison estate, military bases, and... You listen to Jeremy Hunt out this morning on the Trevor Phillips programme on Sky, and it didn't seem like the government had a proper grip of this. You would hope they'd be able to say, this is the problem and this is how we're going to sort it out. And this morning, when it was any questions about what is the scale of this, how quickly can you fix it, there wasn't an answer. And I don't think that would be very reassuring. If you're a parent sending your child back to school tomorrow, or you're a patient sitting in a hospital bed right now, you're going to be thinking, has this ceiling been properly checked and is it safe? Mm. It's interesting that Priti Patel, former Home Secretary, I think, sorry, Dame Priti Patel, <laughs> is quoted and she says, because there are a number of, her, the, of these um, schools that we know will not be opening tomorrow mm. are in Essex and that's where her constituency of Witham is. And she says many of the affected schools are maintained local authority schools and single academy trusts which cannot afford the costs of repairs. And if they can't afford the cost of repairs, you can be sure as eggs is eggs, they won't be able to be able to it transport is. their pupils and their... Uh, teachers and everything else when they find new premises and so on. It, yeah. This is you can a just serious see problems problem. upon problems that are arising yes. from this.